All right, let's start. Let's say a quick prayer. God, thank you for giving us this season. Thank you for this time together. Thank you for the story of Jesus coming to this earth as a man. And thank you that you can teach us from that. And we pray that we have ears to hear it this morning. In your name, amen. amen. So if you were here for first service, this is going to be the same text that Matt taught on this morning. But that's fine because the Bible is inexhaustible. So we can read a text again and again and again and always learn new things. So today is the announcement of the birth of John the Baptist as well as Mary. We're going to do both of them. So turn to Luke chapter 1. We're going to primarily be in Luke's gospel, but we'll also look a little bit at what Matthew has to say. And we will jump right in because we have a lot for this morning. Luke chapter 1. Ch verses 1 through 4 is just a simple introduction. Luke describes what he's writing, who he's writing to, what his purpose is. And then in verse 5, he picks up the story. Luke 1, verse 5, In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zacharias of the division of, Ab of Abijah, and he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. The very first line, in the days of Herod, is important. Luke probably wrote his gospel around the year 60, 61 AD. So there would have been people alive and living who would have read that line and immediately, if they, you know, if they were old enough, had been able to recall what those days were like. In the days of Herod, the king of Judea. And they were not good days. Let me read to you how Chuck Swindoll describes this. Without question, 6 BC, which is about the time period of when the, the, the narrative of the advent takes place, was a lousy time to live in Judea. Herod the Great had seized the throne of Israel through bloody intrigue and with political support from Rome. Herod the Great, you understand, was a puppet king to Rome. Rome was in control of the region at the time. Herod was the king reporting to the emperor. Seized the throne through bloody intrigue and with political support from Rome. Then, once in power, he guided his stolen title, what he called himself, King of the Jews. So ruthlessly, he even put his own son to death when any of them posed a significant political threat. A writer in the 5th century noted, When Caesar Augustus heard that Herod, the king of the Jews, had ordered all boys in Syria under the age of two to be murdered, he said, I would rather be Herod's pig than Herod's son. He built a magnificent temple to the God of Israel, an architectural wonder in his day, yet gave the administration to one corrupt high priest after another. He taxed the Jews through the temple in keeping with the Old Testament law, and then used to proceed to break the first commandment, building cities and temples in honor of the emperor and his pantheon of Roman deities. It was a time of unprecedented economic political advancement for the rich and horrific oppression for everyone else. By the first century BC, a dark cloud had settled over Israel, blocking any ray of hope. So that's what times were like when you read that phrase, in the days of Herod, king of Judea. Yet in those days, there was a priest named Zacharias. He was of the division of Abijah, and there were 24 divisions. And, and, and like, again, if you were here this morning, Matt mentioned there were 1,800 priests around. There were many, many priests, all of these different divisions. And his wife, Elizabeth, was also of the daughters of Aaron. And you understand to be a priest, you had to be of the line of Aaron. Aaron was the very first priest, so you had to be of his line. Verse 6, they were both righteous in the sight of God, walking blamelessly in all his commandments and requirement of the Lord. But they had no child because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both advanced in years. So Elizabeth is unable to conceive. She's barren, yet they're a godly couple walking blamelessly righteous in the sight of god following the lives yet they are barren elizabeth was and um his her husband advanced in years and you understand of course to be barren was a sign of social stigma back in those days and, and it was it was especially in ancient israel because the thought was if you're not able to have children what have you done that god would would strike you with the ability not to produce air what, what have you done to make God so angry that he would not give you children? So there was that social stigma, and especially for a couple being in the priesthood. 
verse 8. Now it happened that while he would perform in his priestly service before God in the appointed order of his division, according to the custom of the priestly office, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people were in prayer outside at the hour of the incense offering. This would have been considered a high, high honor for a priest to do. This would probably be the peak of his priestly career to do. Not everyone got to do this. You could go your entire career being a priest. He's not the high priest, but you would go your entire career being a priest and never get this opportunity to go into the temple and offer the incense. And the way it works is he would walk up to the veil which separated the Holy of Holies from the holy place. He wouldn't enter the Holy of Holies. Only the high priest would do that one day a year, and he would burn the incense there. So he goes in by himself, no doubt a high moment in his career. In verse 11, an angel of the Lord appeared to him standing to the right of the altar of the incense. Zacharias was troubled when he saw the angel and fear gripped him. It's a common theme throughout the scripture. When an angel appears to someone, the very first thing they say is do not fear. Do not be troubled because apparently angels can take on pretty terrifying images. They can take on the form of a human. Genesis 19 mentioned that when the angels come down disguised as men, so much so that the men of Sodom want to sleep with them. You remember that? Hebrews talks about being hospitable to strangers because the writer of the Hebrews says, you, you never know, you may entertain an angel one day disguised as a human. But when, of course, they don't take on that human flesh, they can be terrifying. I'm going to read a description from Ezekiel. You can turn if you want. Otherwise, I'll just read it. Ezekiel chapter 1. This is verse 4. As I looked, behold, a storm wind was coming from the north, a great cloud with fire flashing forth continually, and a bright light around it, and in the midst of something, in the midst, something with glowing metal in the midst of a fire. He's going to describe the anatomy of what he calls these four creatures, but pay attention how it's described. Verse 5, within it there were figures resembling four living beings. And this was their appearance. They had human form. Each of them had four faces with four wings. Their legs were straight and their feet were like a calf's hoof and gleamed like burnished bronze. Under their wings on the four sides were human hands. As for the faces and the wings of the four of them, the wings touched one another, and their faces did not turn when they moved. Each went straight forward. As for the form of the face, each had the face of a man. All four had the face of a lion on the right and the face of a bull on the left, and all four had the face of an eagle. Such were their faces. Their wings were spread out above. Each had two touching the other, being, and two covering their bodies. And each went straight forward wherever the spirit was about to go without turning as they went. In the midst of... Of the living being, there was something that looked like burning coals of fire, like torches darting back and forth among the living beings. The fire would brighten, the lightning would flash, and the living beings ran to and fro like bolts of lightning. That imagery, four faces, one of a human, one of a lion, one of a bull. So you could imagine, we don't know what, and we know this angel was Gabriel, we don't know what he looked like when he came to Zechariah, but evidently enough to scare him. And again, get, get that image out of your mind of that, you know, long robe, gentle face that obviously not what it was because Zacharias was troubled and said fear gripped him Ryan yeah okay I have two questions but my first um was do you think that the angels had not really been at work in those 400 years of silence that they weren't in like active work on the earth during that time and this is kind of I guess Gabriel's comeback that's a good question. I, we don't really know for sure because it's, it is a 400 years of silence. But I would, I would, I would be surprised if they weren't okay. at work. Yeah. Okay, Especially I'm... given what happened, you know, just all the events that went on that those, that time period. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And then my other question: Do you think there's significance to where the where and when this was happening? That this happened when Zachariah was able to be in the temple, and it happened in the separated chamber and like in a more i guess holy place i think so i think so especially considering he he the lots were drawn for him to go into the temple i think so yeah i think that would the providence of god allowing him to go into the temple and send in the angel again yep 
And it's interesting because we're not told where Mary was when she was given that announcement, but Zacharias was doing his work there. So do you I, think I, it was like a, a sign of honor for Zachariah, or do you think it was for the moment of privacy? Maybe both. Yeah. Have good thoughts. Verse 13. The angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias. Your petition has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you will give him the name John. Do not be afraid. Your prayers have been answered. You've been praying for a child. Here's your prayers are answered. You will have one. You will give him the name John. You will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and he will drink no wine or liquor, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit while yet in his mother's womb, and he will turn many of the sons of Israel back to the Lord their God. It is he who will go as a forerunner before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous so as to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So it's evident that this is not just any baby that Zacharias and Elizabeth are going to have. This is a very special baby. And you, you, you pick up on the fact that this baby will take the Nazarite vow. The fact that he will drink no wine, no liquor. The same vow that Samson took as well as Samuel. And, and, and in those cases, they had to cut their hair. Probably the same for John. But Luke just doesn't mention that detail. And that was uncommon to take it as a lifetime vow, right? It was usually more of just for a set period of time. Yes. Yes. Yep. Yep. However, verse 17 solidifies what makes this baby especially unique. Verse 17, it is he who will go as a forerunner before him in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the father back to the children. That phrase, to turn the hearts of the father back to the children, is the angel quoting Malachi 4, verses 5 through 6. Malachi 4, 5 through 6 is actually the very last verse of the Old Testament. And I'm going to turn, I'm going to turn there real quick and read that to you. Malachi 4, verse 5. This is what God says. Behold... I am going to send you Elijah the prophet. Elijah the prophet at the time this is written, it's long gone. You remember, he never died. Elijah was taken up to heaven in a whirlwind. He was the one who represented the prophets, right? Moses represented the law. Elijah represented the prophet. Behold, I am going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. He will restore the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, so that I will not come and smite the land with the curse. And this is why John, for his entire life, would live with the resemblance that he is Elijah, or at least a type of Elijah. In John 1, they asked John, the, the Jewish Pharisees, they straight asked him, are you Elijah? He said, no, I'm not. Are you the prophet? He said, no, I am not Elijah. I am the voice in the wilderness preparing the way. Well, that's something that Jesus had to go through, too. Everybody thought he was the second coming of Elijah as well. John or Jesus? Jesus yeah. had that as well. Yep, yep, yep. But what's interesting here is here you have this angel quoting Malachi for that verse in reference to the coming of John. So the question is, is John the Baptist the fulfillment of the return of Elijah from Malachi 4? John seemed to have said no because they said, are you Elijah? And John says no. Jesus said something different, actually. Jesus, in Matthew 11, says this. In Matthew 11, verse 11, Jesus says, Truly, I say to you, among those born of women, there is no one greater than John. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Who? John. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffered violence and violent men take it by force. For all the prophets in the law prophesied until John. And if you are willing to accept it, John himself is Elijah who was to come. He who has ears, let him hear it. So you have Jesus saying John is Elijah if you're willing to accept it. So is John the fulfillment of Malachi 4 maybe in the sense that he's a type of Elijah? Or is Elijah still to come? We know that in the end times, God is going to send what Revelation called the two witnesses. They're going to come, they're going to preach, they are unnamed. 
and a lot of people have guessed who they are. The most common one is probably Moses and Elijah. They were the ones who appeared with Jesus on the Transfiguration. So is John the fulfillment of the return of Elijah? Maybe, maybe he's a type of it. The only problem is Malachi said, I'm not going to send you a type of Elijah. I'm going to send you Elijah the prophet. It could be what sometimes we call a double prophecy where this was fulfilled in the coming of John who is the type of Elijah as well as Elijah will one day return. One thing though Jesus touches on which is which is uh, worth mentioning in verse 11. I say to you, among those born of women there had not arisen anyone greater than John the Baptist. John is an Old Testament prophet. You understand that? Though he's in the New Testament, he is not yet the, he had not yet partaken of the new covenant because he dies before Jesus fulfills the new covenant. He dies before Jesus dies on the cross and establishes the new covenant relationship that we as believers have. So John experiences what every other Old Testament prophet experienced in terms of a relationship with Yahweh. But Jesus said there is no greater prophet than John. Why? Because all of the other prophets, Abraham, David, Daniel, Ezekiel, Elijah, they all had the same message, and that message is the Messiah is coming one day, one day, one day, one day. But John's message is he's here, and there he is. That's why Jesus said there is no one greater than John. But then in the same breath, what does he say? He who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than John. That is mind-blowing. The least of all the Christians is greater than John the Baptist, who was greater than all the Old Testament saints. So the least of the Christians is greater than Abraham, David, Ezekiel, Elijah, Daniel, Moses. Why? Because we have a relationship with Jesus none of them had. We have the indwelling of God inside of us that none of them had. Some of them had it. We have it in a permanent sense. We don't have to go to the temple to encounter the living God like many of them did. That's the difference. That's why Jesus said, he who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than John. Okay, back to Luke. Does anyone have thoughts or question? <laughs> You're going deep. <laughs> okay. That's the announcement. Zechariah's response, verse 18. How will I know that this is for certain? For I am an old man, and my wife is advanced in years. Evidently, he forgot the story of Abraham and Isaac. They, uh, Abraham and Sarah, sorry. They were in the same predicament. Abraham and Sarah were old. God promised them a son. But we're old. We can't do this. Zacharias should have known. But isn't that funny, though? We do that all the time, right? God can work miracles for somebody else. But not for me. You're not going to do that for me. I know you did that for them, but not me. You're not going to do that for me. You believe it when it's someone else, but when it comes to us, we have a hard time believing it personally. How will I know this is so? Verse 19, the angel answered and said to him, I am Gabriel who stands in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. The angel's response is interesting because he names himself. Why would he do that? Because there are only two angels named in the entire Bible. Michael. Michael is the archangel. He's the warrior. He's the one who is not named, but he's the one who probably will throw Satan into the lake of fire one day. He is Satan's rival. He's the warrior. He's the one who leads the angels in war. Gabriel is the other one named, and he's named in the book of Daniel. In chapter 8 and 9, he's the one that brings Daniel the messages. Zacharias would have known Gabriel because he knows the book of Daniel. He's a godly priest. So when the angel announced it, I am Gabriel, what he's it's in essence in saying is, do you remember the book of Daniel, Zacharias? Do you remember that angel Gabriel 500 years ago? I am that angel, and I'm here to tell you this is true. Not only that, but I stand in the presence of God. I have been sent by him to speak to you. And here's another sign, if you don't believe me, you shall be silent and unable to speak until the day when these things take place. Why? Because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their proper time. Verse 21, the people were waiting for Zacharias and were wondering what, what the delay was in the temple. Evidently, he should have been out by now. Sometimes people would have thought that if a priest would take a long time or sometimes would never come out, 
sometimes the thought would the priest mismanage the sacrifice or the burning or whatever, and God smoked them dead there. When the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies, this isn't in the Old Testament, but extra biblical literature talks about how they would put ropes on the ankles of the high priest so that if the high priest messed up somehow and God smote him dead then, they would drag him out so they would not have to go into the Holy of Holies. So they're wondering what's going on, verse 22. When he came out, he was unable to speak to them, and they realized that he had seen a vision. He kept making signs, and he remained mute. When the days of his priestly service were ended, and this lasted about a week, his priestly service, they went back home. After these days, Elizabeth, his wife, became pregnant. The angel was telling the truth. She kept herself in seclusion for five months, she had a mute husband. What else is she going to do, right? Mind if we just hang out at home saying, this is the way the Lord had dealt with me in the days when he looked with favor upon me to take away my disgrace among men. I often wonder what her response was to, all, to her husband becoming mute. Either this is the greatest day of my life or this is the worst day of my life. Mm. Probably nothing in between. <laughs> One of the two. I think it's interesting how this concept of silence and seclusion is brought in before, because I think we see that a lot in Jesus's ministry, that he's constantly bringing himself into seclusion to, I guess, kind of recharge with God. Mm -hmm. And he's constantly telling people that he's worked miracles on to remain quiet. And we're seeing that theme start even before Jesus's ministry in Elizabeth and Zechariah. Mm -hmm. Nine months of silence. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Jesus drew himself. Time of quiet prayer. Yep. That's a great point. Now let's keep reading. Luke takes a break. He stopped the narrative of Elizabeth and Zacharias and he shifts to the narrative to the um, narrative of Mary. Verse 26. Now in the sixth month, this is the six months of Elizabeth's pregnancy. Another verse will spell that out. The angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth. Nazareth was a northern city that had a reputation for immorality. It was, in essence, a hick town, if you will. That's why one of his disciples say, what good can come from Nazareth, right? Nothing good came from there. It was a countryside town. There was no educated people, no intellect, no, nothing like that. Only backwards kind of stuff. To a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the descendants of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And coming to her, he said to her, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was very perplexed at this kind of statement and kept pondering what kind of salutation it was. Th just think about it for a second. Mary is a peasant young woman in this town no one has heard of. And she gets a visit from an angel of God, Gabriel, who visited the mighty prophet Daniel, and he says to her, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. No wonder she would perplex. She may have thought, do you have the right person? The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. Now just follow, imagine the thought process as this unfolds. Greet and favored one. Me? This, I'm just, I'm a small peasant girl in this town nobody's heard of. You have found favor with God. You will bear a son. Interesting. I'm a virgin. I, I have yet to marry my husband. That, this, this is not lining up. Not only will you bear a son, he will be great. You will call his name Jesus. Okay, I guess I don't have a choice. He will be great. He will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. D David? You mean the King David of the old, the mighty King David? That throne? He will reign over the house of Israel forever. The, I'm going to have this son who's going to be the king who's going to reign over Israel forever and ever. Just imagine this. And obviously, she had lots of questions. But she asked the obvious question. Verse 34, the angel, Mary said to the angel, How can this be since I am a virgin? 
The angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. So not only are you going to have this mighty conqueror king-like son, you're gonna, your son is going to be called the Son of God. And you're wondering, as this unfold, when Mary is starting to piece together what exactly is happening. And you wonder when it hits her that this son that this angel is announcing that she is going to have is the Messiah that the entire Old Testament had been prophesying about. Notice, though, something interesting. There is no mention at all from the angel to Mary that this son is going to take away the sins of the world. That this son is going to save people from their sin. There is no mention of that at all. The angel will mention that to Joseph. But Mary is not told any of that. Mary is told she is going to have a son who is going to conquer and reign and his kingdom will have no end. She's not told anything about Jesus coming to take away the sins of the world. Now obviously as time went on I'm sure she pieced it together. But I've never noticed that before. She had never told anything about that. Verse 36. Behold even your relative Elizabeth has also conceived a son in her old age. And she who was called barren is now in her sixth month, for nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, the bond slave of the Lord, may it be done according may it be done to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. I think as Protestants, we have a knee-jerk reaction when it comes to Mary in response to how Catholics treat Mary. And because Catholics treat Mary at a at a high level that shouldn't be that way. Our knee-jerk response is to say, no, 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 Mary's not that at all. You know, but in doing so, I think we take something away from Mary because the reality is God could have chosen anyone to bear in her womb the Son of God. He, he could have chosen anyone he wanted to, but he chose this specific young girl living in the town of Nazareth, Mary. And I think that says something about Mary. And as we see, I think we'll see that when we keep reading. <clears throat> Does anyone have thoughts or questions so far? I think it's interesting that both Zachariah and Mary in some way question Gabriel mm -hmm. and he has such different responses for both of them. Like Zachariah is kind of punished for questioning and Mary is given an explanation kindly. Yep. yep. Don't you think he did her heart though in a way? I mean, I think Zachariah was more like, what are you talking about? Whereas Mary's like, I just don't understand. <laughs> I think there's a different, I think they responded differently. We don't hear the inflection in the text, of course, so we don't know how they responded, but I've always gotten the impression that Brown must have responded kind of like, yeah, right. We don't know what you're talking about. As opposed to Mary saying, I just don't understand how this could happen. I, it had to have been because one's punished and one is praised, so. Yeah, no, and, and we're, we're not told. That, right, and right. we don't know the inflection the reasoning. and the tone of their voices when they said it. And, yep. I wondered if Zachariah wasn't almost irritated that, you know, we're old, so why are you coming and telling me this now? Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. as to most Mary going, okay, but I'm a virgin, so I don't really understand how that can happen. Mm -hmm. yep. Yep. I wonder about how much Elizabeth knew because, you know, when Mary comes to visit her, she has this immediate response. Yes, she felt it and said the Holy Spirit was there, but she felt it. How much did she know leading up to that? At this point, she's six months pregnant. Zachariah couldn't talk. How? I mean, he. So did she know what happened to him in the temple? How? I mean, how much does she know? Right. In all of this, you mean and she seems to have an understanding that this is something special is happening. Yeah. You mean before Mary came to see before her, Mary how much? Came to yeah, see her. yeah, yeah. Because when Mary got there, her immediate response was like, "Whoa, you know, right? Something just happened here, and the mother of you know is going to bear my Lord." I mean, just yep. she knew something, right? And she'd been alone for five months. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. So what was going on? So yep. how did she get this knowledge, this mm -hmm. awareness? Yep. Not to mention, I, I kind of, I kind of like Elizabeth's uh, opportunity to have silence during pregnancy. <laughs> Because, you know, think about it. She had a whole nine months with mm -hmm. nobody bugging her. <laughs> <laughs> I thought about that. I hadn't mm -hmm. thought about it before. Mm -hmm. she had like, none, of those, none of those questions like, you ready yet? Yeah. You know, any day now. Yeah, I'm like, Ooh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Kind of 
Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yes, I know you're an Aussie and you can barely walk, so what's for dinner? Yeah. <laughs> the one that got me all the time was any day now. Yeah. Well, not really. We're still two months away, but <laughs> <laughs> any day, I guess. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Stay in there as long as they're supposed to. Yeah. Used to say to me with my last one, are you ever going to have this baby? No, I don't think I will. <laughs> <laughs> I think she's just going to stay right here. Yeah. Now, verse 39, at this time, Mary arose and went to hurry at the time she was given the announcement. At this time, Mary arose and went in a hurry to a hill country to the city of Judah. And she entered the house of Zacharias, he still can't talk, and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. She cried out with a loud voice and said, Blessed are you among women, blessed is the fruit of your womb. How has it happened to me that the mother of my Lord would come to me? Now you mentioned, what did she know up to this point? By now she seemed to have figured it out. Here comes the mother of my Lord. How had this happened? How has it happened that the very God who lives in the Holy of Holies, where my husband would have never dared to enter, is now inside of your belly? That's the thought behind that. For behold, when the, sun, when the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb, the baby, in my, the baby leaped in my womb for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what had been spoken to her by the Lord. And Mary says, and she breaks out into her magnificent, right? The, the, the psalm of praise. My soul exalts the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. By the way, that's an important verse because you understand the Catholic Church teaches how, how Mary was sinless, that Mary was not a sinner. But here you have Mary calling God her Savior. So evidently Mary knew she was a sinner because she called God her savior. For he has had regard for the humble state of his bond slave. And behold, from this time on, all generations will count me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me, and holy is his name, and his mercy is upon generation after generation towards those who fear him. He had done mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who were proud in the thoughts of their heart. He had brought down rulers from their thrones, and he has exalted those who were humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, and, and had sent away the rich empty-handed. He had given help to Israel, his servant, in remembrance of his mercy, as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and his descendants forever. And Mary stayed with her about three months and returned home. And that psalm, it's, just, it's, it's um, all throughout of it, it's Old Testament quotation. So uh, Mary was obviously deeply immersed in the Old Testament scriptures, a deep woman of God, and that shows you why God would have picked her. And you, you look at this too, and it, it's all about praising God. It's nothing about her. Like, look at me. He, ch he chose me. It's none of that at all. But it's all about how God chose someone, chose me, to bear this Messiah who saved the world. Now we keep reading verse 57. Now the time had come for Elizabeth to give birth. And she gave birth to a son. Her neighbors and her relatives heard that the Lord displayed his great mercy toward her, and they were rejoicing with her. And it happened that on the eighth day they came to circumcise the child, like, like a good Jewish family, that's what you do, that they were going to call him Zacharias after his father. But his mother answered and said, No, indeed, but he shall be called John. And they said to her, There is no one among your relatives who is called by that name. And you can just imagine Elizabeth trying to explain it all, you know, like, well, you see, it's a long story. This angel visited him, told him we had to call him John. He didn't believe him, that dummy, and now he's mute for nine months. But it hasn't been that bad, you know. You just picture how she's trying to explain it all. They made sign to his father to ask what he wanted for him to be called. He asked for a tablet, and he wrote as follows. His name is John. And at once, well, all were astonished. And at once his mouth was open and his tongue loosed and he began to speak in praise of God. Fear came on all those living around them and all these matters were being talked about in the hill country of Judea. You can imagine that. Hey, you remember that guy who'd been mute for nine months? He, 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 he just now started talking. 
and he named his son John, which is weird because no one in his family named John, you know, and the news gets passed around. What then will this child turn out to be? For the hand of the Lord was certainly with him, obviously. He would grow up to become John the Baptist, who would say, make way, behold, and he would point to Jesus out, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. All right, turn to Matthew, and we'll close with this, because the question now is, where in the world is Mary's fiancé? And what is his involvement with all this? And you, you, you can only imagine this must have been very difficult for Mary once she starts to become visibly pregnant. Because the implication is she is betrothed currently to Joseph. We'll define what that means in a moment. But the implication is she has been unfaithful to Joseph. And you can imagine Joseph, this poor guy, thinking what's going on in his mind once he realizes what's happening. Now look at verse uh, Matthew 1, chapter, uh, verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Now, to be betrothed was essentially to be engaged, but it was a little bit different. So let me read you how it would be understood in the Jewish context. The Jews of first century Palestine saw marriage as a joining of two families. As in many cultures, both past and present, first century Hebrew parents agreed, I'm sorry, arranged the marriages of their sons and daughters. According to rabbinical law, this could take place sometime after the age of consent, 12 for girls, 13 for boys. While the children weren't given the final word in the matter, their personal desires were usually taken into account. Once the decision was made to pursue the match, the fathers discussed every detail, prepared a legal contract, which would be read during the marriage ceremony, vows were taken, tokens were exchanged, and the family celebrated. At the conclusion of the ceremony, the boy and girl would enter the betrothal, betrothal period, which could be no less than one month, but typically lasted up to a year. During this period, the newly married couple was husband and wife in every respect except that they were to live with their families and refrain from sex. This interval between the vows and the home taken served several purposes. First, it gave time for the groom to prepare the couple's home, which was usually a one-room addition to his parents' house for the time being. Second, it gave time for the bride to complete several, several purification rituals and to demonstrate that she was sexually pure. Proof of paternity was of supreme importance in the Jewish law, so a divorced woman or a widow had to wait no fewer than 90 days in order to prove that she did not carry her former husband's child. Third, unlike in many other cultures, Jews did not expect a young girl to leave her family in one morning and lie in bed in the stranger of the neck. The betrothal period gave the husband and wife plenty of time to bond under the strict supervision of their family coming together as a couple. To end the marriage during this period required an official divorce decree, and if either of them had engaged in sex with someone else, it would consider considered adultery, which would carry the penalty of stoning. So it was engagement in the sense that we understand it, but by law they were married, to the point that if one had been unfaithful, Joseph, in this case, would have had the right to stone Mary under the Jewish law. And I mean, and it does sound harsh, but that's how God did, did view adultery in the Old Testament. It was punishable by stoning. But Joseph's response when he finds out about all of this is interesting. Verse 19, Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, planned to send her away secretly. In other words, Joseph, when he finds out about this, said, I'm not going to bring her out to the town square and stone her. I love her, what she did with Ron, but I'm just going to end this quietly and I'm going to divorce her secretly. And hopefully it'll all go under the bridge, and that'll be that. And that, look, if you're Joseph, and Mary comes up to you and says, I'm pregnant, but you need to understand that I'm carrying the Messiah that Isaiah 9 foretold would be born of a virgin. What would go through Joseph's mind? You, you understand, this would, right, That's the best this would be... <laughs> Say that again. That's the best excuse right, I've ever right. heard. Right, right. And I'm sure others have tried that excuse, yeah. you know, other young Jewish girls. So this is a completely understandable response. 
So he so planned to send her away secretly. What's that? Would they have been subject to stoning if they had had a sexual, if the couple is mm-hmm. betrothed, if they have a sexual relationship during that time period, are they subject to stoning or is yeah. it just shameful? Yes, they are too. They are subject to stoning? Yep. Okay. Yep. By Even the parents? Though technically they're the... married. Even though technically they were married. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Yep. But would the parents have to call them out on that one? I'm not sure how exactly it would work, but yeah. And and if if it, if it, if the male would be the adultery, it would be he who would be stoned as well too during that time period. But what is interesting is once Joseph accepts this, so in verse twenty, when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, "Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who had been conceived is the in her." is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, you shall call his name Jesus, and he will save people from their sins. And there it is how Joseph is told about how Jesus is going to save people from their sin. Mary's not told that. Now all of this took place to fulfill what was spoken through the Lord, by the Lord through the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. Joseph awoke from his sleep and did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took Mary as his wife, but kept her a virgin until she gave birth and he called his name Jesus. That verse again is important because the Catholic Church teaches that Mary died a virgin, which of course is not true. She never had children outside right. of Jesus. Yeah. Right. The New Testament is clear Jesus they had brothers and sisters. Yeah. They say that that's mistranslated that... Uh, that uh, that they that every child every brother or sister of Jesus mentioned is probably just a cousin right. or brother and sister in the spiritual sense that she never conceived any she, that they never had a sexual relationship. Yeah. That's their teaching, yeah. Yep. Hmm. What is interesting in the how I'm not this, sure why when they benefit from that. Yeah. When Joseph <laughs> agrees to take Mary as his wife, Joseph does so with the understanding that he knows he will be viewed as unfaithful because, in essence, him and Mary had this baby together when they were not supposed to during the betrothal period. So Joseph would have probably lived his entire life as being looked upon as sexually impure, as did Mary, because you remember Jesus had a conversation with the Pharisees one time, and the Pharisees threw this sort of ad hominem attack, and they said, look, we weren't born of fornication to Jesus. The implication being he lived with this his entire life, as did Mary and, and probably his Joseph. Were sinful in his conception. Is that what they were saying to him? Right. Yeah, because there's even verses of them saying where he <coughs> talks about God as his father and they jokingly say, like, well, at least we know who our father is. Right. Oh, that's true. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> okay. Does anyone have any final thoughts or questions? crazy how much the story brings in themes of like the old testament into it and how we saw a little bit of like at abraham's story in this and you see like a little bit of daniel in it and a little bit of the minor prophets and elijah like all of these things from the get-go of jesus's life are fulfilling and mimicking the old testament yeah and it's like we said last week it's just a continuation of of the whole story it's not broken up of an old and new testament it's one big story and it this is just a continuation of it yep anyone else all right so next week will be the last week the christmas story and then we'll take two two a two-week break and then we'll start up something new in the new year what's next week next week we'll talk about the birth We'll talk about the decree that went out, what sent them, what, what, why were they in Bethlehem? The Old Testament prophesied that the, Jesus would be born in Bethlehem. They live in Nazareth. Why were they in Bethlehem when it happened? The mysterious wise men, who are these guys? And why, by the way, why were they there in Bethlehem when Jesus was born? Would that just look? How did they know? We'll talk about how they knew when to come, why they came, and, and all of that. And then the actual birth itself. All right. Let's close with a prayer and we'll be done.